Welcome to the Environmental Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Grady, and our mission is to bring you interviews with leaders in the environmental industry with the goal of providing you information about industry trends, climate change, future energies, circular economy, regulatory topics, and service, service providers transforming the industry. And today's guest is Robert Blatt. He is the partner at the environmental of the environmental practice area of the litigation department in the Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky offices of Taft, Destinius, and Hollister. The, he's also the author of the book Exposure. And he, for the, many of you may know, he is the attorney behind the movie of the award-winning movie, The True Story of Dark Waters, uh, about the PFAS contamination in Parkersburg, West Virginia. Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, wow. You know, I watched this show and, you know, it came out, uh, what, in December 2019. I just watched it, I want to say, about four months ago. And it was on my list when it first came out. But, you know, it didn't have a long shelf life in the movie theaters. And, uh, of course, COVID hit. And so I finally got around to watching it. And I was just amazed. I was just I, I didn't know what to say. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is like the most important environmental movie that I've seen in my probably entire life. I mean, how did how did this movie come to, to be? Well, you know, it was a, it was a long time in coming. Uh, it was a 20 year process of litigation. And, um, uh, you know, we were you know, actually there had been an article that appeared in The New York Times magazine in 2016 that was summarizing what had been going on for almost 20 years and trying right. to uncover the, uh, the, the, the contamination outside of Parkersburg with this chemical used in making Teflon. And Mark Ruffalo one actually had read that article and uh -huh. reached out to me wanting to find a way to, to bring that story out to a wider audience. Uh, he was a little surprised to, to hear that, you know, that uh, this had been going on in the United States in modern yeah. times and really nobody was talking about it and nobody really knew it was happening. So really wanted to try to find a way to bring that story to a wider audience. And, you know, given the public health threat involved, I, I wanted to do what we could to, to help bring that story out. So we're incredibly fortunate to team up with somebody like, like Mark Ruffalo who was so passionate and people at Participant Media who just did, I think, a fantastic job taking oh, a story over 20 yeah. years and yeah. putting it into two hours. So. Oh, no, yeah, I totally agree. And and just to watch the the, the, the events that's transpired in that movie, just uh, I was amazed. And we're going to get to some of those, those the events because I've got a couple of questions for you because I'm just, you know, it, like I said, I mean, it's been it's an honor to have you on the show just to see the fight that you've been fighting in the courts over the years for this type of, uh, uh, you know, the, these these people that have been exposed in West Virginia. But, um, you know, the, the opening scene for those who have not seen the movie, you know, one of the main, inter, you know, uh, openings is this this person, this, this character is Wilbur Tennant. He comes in and, you know, he meets you for the first time and he calls you out by your childhood name. <laughs> You're like, who the heck is this guy? <laughs> and, uh, you know, at least that's the way it was portrayed in the, in the, in the movie. And, and I'm sure in somewhat real life, it was the same. It's like, and he's the person really, you know, made, made you have a, an interest in, in, in taking on this case. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. It was an uh, individual's name was Wilbur Tennant, who was a farmer uh, from outside of Parkersburg, whose cows were getting sick and dropping dead. And yeah. nobody would talk to him. Nobody would help him out. And uh, he reached out to me actually through contact with a family friend. Uh, he His friend was uh, good friends with my grandmother. And they had just so happened to be talking across the fence one day. And he was mentioning how he was really needing somebody could help him figure out what was happening to these cows. And my grandmother had mentioned her grandson was an environmental lawyer. So <laughs> certainly I could help. So that's certainly. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, Hey grandma, you, you, you can't just give out my phone number to just anybody. right? <laughs> but it sounded like it was a good opportunity. I mean, it, it turned out to be a good situation. Although I think you, uh, you, you spent a lot of time and effort in this thing as we'll get into, but you know, I've been in the industry myself for a little, almost 30 years. Okay. And, uh, I'm, you know, I'm a, a consultant. I've been in consulting for 20 and I was a regulator for eight. 
and uh, before I got into consulting. But I am amazed at how many people in the environmental industry have not seen this movie yet. I, it's just yeah. cra- it's crazy. Well, you know, as you mentioned right when we began, you know, the, the timing of all this, you know, the movie came out right at the end of 2019. Uh, it started to open up in Europe right at the beginning of 2020, and it was right as the pandemic was hitting. Right. Uh, and so we had the theater started shutting down. And, you know, unfortunately, again, I think this particular topic, it's been very difficult to get um, even the mainstream major media networks to want to talk about it, even with a movie with Anne Hathaway and Tim Robbins yeah. and Mark Buffalo. It yeah. was very difficult to get anybody to even talk about the movie existing. So it's, um, you know, it's rather remarkable, but it's not surprising when you just look back at the history of what was going on here with, you know, 20 years of active attempts to try to keep this story under wraps, to keep this information covered up. And, um, you know, <laughs> it just shows how, how difficult it can be, even when there's a major movie out there. Right. Um, you know, it's it's still difficult when you're dealing with complicated science that yeah. with chemicals with long, complicated names that don't roll yeah. off the tongue. It's not like lead or arsenic. You know, this is perfluorooctanoic acid and it's all these acronyms. It's difficult and it's difficult to find ways to communicate it so that people understand why this re- actually this story relates to all of us it's not just about a farm in west virginia this stuff's in all of our water almost all over the planet and in the blood of almost every one of us i know and and, and when i started to think about this i was like oh my gosh and and I, there was the, that 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 point in the movie too where you had this like aha moment like you were telling your wife honey it's everywhere you know it's like and she, you're trying to convince her that, and to explain why you are spending so much of your hard work and, and, you know, just your tireless efforts into trying to make this uh, information known and to, to support and win this case, these cases for these people who have been exposed. I mean, it was just amazing. I was like, wow. I mean, that's just, so then you're thinking, yeah, okay. Is it in everything? And you start thinking, well, yeah, I mean, it's in, I guess, you know, as soon as I watched the movie, I went to go cook something. I was like, oh my gosh, my frying pan's got, you know, nonstick for, you know, stuff. That's, that's, that's the stuff. That's what we're talking about. It's in your carpets. It's, it's in your scotch guard, right? That's your, you know, remember you go buy a, a sofa and you make sure you scotch guard your, your couch, you know, you know, you gotta make sure so you don't get stains on it. You know I mean? That's all the kind of stuff we're talking about, right? Right. You know, the movie focuses on one of these chemicals uh, known as PFOA. That was the one that DuPont was using and making Teflon out in West Virginia. Yeah. And what we, what we, what we, came to learn through that litigation and in de- delving into all of the internal documents about that chemical PFOA is that this is just one of hundreds, if not thousands of chemicals in this big ma- family of completely man-made chemicals that we now call PFAS, P-F-A-S, right. per and polyfluoroalkylated substances. PFOA is just one of those. The other chemical that's very closely related is called PFOS. That's the one, as you mentioned, that was used in things like Scotchgard and firefighting foams and, you know, uh, waterproofing chemicals and things of that nature. So if you start to look at the types of products that this wider group of chemicals have been used in over the last 70 years, it's rather mind blowing. Uh, You know, it's waterproof, stain resistant clothing, carpeting, fast food wrappers and packaging, firefighting foams, uh, wire cabling. You know, it's just, it's an incredible array of products. And unfortunately, most of us had no idea, you know, that we were even being exposed to these chemicals because they were unregulated. Right. Were that's, the that's right. Or, that was, the yeah, uh, that is so, the whole, that's the whole crux of this, right? So even though we've been using this stuff for 70 years, we're all just now learning about them. You hear them referred to as emerging contaminants. No. Yeah, the contaminants have been out there and have been used for decades and decades. Our awareness is only emerging that they've been out there. And we're still trying to figure out which products they've been used in because a lot of that's kept confidential by the companies that use them. 
Sure. Or companies don't know, didn't even know they were using these chemicals. because Right, because the they were just buying them as a product to, to, to build, build their own products, you know? I mean, it was just Correct. a piece of the formulary, right? Well, how dangerous are the PFO, PFOS chemicals, and why are they called forever chemicals? Well, you know, it's uh, the more we learn about these chemicals, the more concerning they are. And as you saw, if those of you that saw the film Dark Waters, or there's a documentary about this story as well called The Devil We Know, you see that there was this massive series of human studies that were done. Because as mm -hmm. we were digging into all of the documents about these chemicals, what we found was the companies themselves that were making and using these chemicals, like 3M and DuPont, had all kinds of toxicity studies showing all kinds of different adverse effects in different laboratory animals, including cancer. You know, PFOA was found to be a confirmed animal carcinogen in mm. the early 80s. Mm. And, you know, the, then there were two. There was a second cancer study confirming that it could cause testicular tumors, pancreatic tumors, liver tumors. Then there were worker studies. Yet we kept hearing, well, but you can't prove that any of this would happen to people that are drinking it at the levels that we're finding out in the public water. Mm -hmm. So we did these massive new studies that you see in the film that took seven right. years, 70,000 people came together. <laughs> right. that, and at the end of that process, we were able to confirm, frankly, what we had been seeing in the internal studies going back decades, PFOA was linked with kidney cancer, testicular cancer, ulcerative colitis, thyroid disease, preeclampsia, and high cholesterol. And that was through this independent panel that both sides, including DuPont, picked these people who were to be independent looking at all of the data, mm -hmm. not just what was published out there, but also the internal studies and doing these new studies, looking at all of that, and confirm these six diseases. And since that time, that was in 20, that, that process ended by around 2012. Since mm -hmm. then, the nude studies that have been done show even more disturbing findings, particularly with respect to impacts on our immune system. You know, particularly when we're trying to deal with the, the outfall of the pandemic here. Mm -hmm. These are chemicals in our blood, in our water that can decrease our immune response and possibly even decrease the effectiveness of vaccines. That's some of the most current data that people are looking at right now, um, you know, for obvious reasons with the pandemic. So there's a lot of concern by scientists and regulators that the more we look at this, the more adverse effects that are being found and at the lower and lower levels, we're finding that the, the, the adverse effects are being found being found at even uh, lower levels in the, in the blood or lower exposure levels. And that's what's really causing trouble because these chemicals, you hear them referred to as forever chemicals, because yeah. once they get out into the environment, they don't break down. They don't break once, down, right? No, once they get into people, they have, we have a hard time eliminating them because they're- They bioaccumulate, right? Correct. And so they build up to higher and higher levels. So there's a lot of concern that when you have these chemicals that can have effects at such low levels and they build up over time, that's why we're seeing now regulatory guidelines are getting lower and lower into the very low part per trillion levels because uh, of you know, the unusual nature of these chemicals. You know, the, the, one of the things I've noticed uh, from you know being on this side of the fence of the environmental equation here, so to speak, is... You know, we're seeing, hey, we're, we're talking about all these parts per trillion. I mean, like that is, I mean, ridiculously low, right? Let's be, I mean, I'm used to treating, you know, say so for some volatile organic compounds to parts per million, right? In groundwater and cleanups and soils and things like that. And you're thinking parts per trillion now? I mean, my goodness. But what's not really being communicated in this narrative, at least from what my perspective is, is the really they're not linking those health effects to the whole situation. They're just talking about, well, we got a new regula regulatory limit that we're proposing for this state. EPA hasn't even come out with a, a, an official number yet. I mean, they're prescribing, you know, maybe 70 parts, but they still don't have a, a, a real MCL that's official yet. I mean, th it's unregulated. There's no real regulations yet. Some states are leading the way, uh, but that's going to be confusing. Uh, you know, as you go to state to state, it's going to be a problem. Um, and I just feel like 
the 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 magnitude or the seriousness of this whole discussion around the health effects isn't really being highlighted enough to say this is why we're going to 70 parts per trillion or whatever yeah. the number may be. Yeah, I, I share the concern. I think a lot of, you know, a lot of the people are just focusing on this end result. You know, the here's the number that we have to be concerned about. Here's the here's the level in water. And as you indicated, you know, at the federal level, we still simply just have an unenforceable guideline right. for two of these chemicals, PFOA and PFOS combined of 70 parts per trillion. In states, while we're waiting for an official final enforceable federal standard mm -hmm. or an MCL, states have moved forward to try to set guidelines and those numbers have gotten much lower than 70 parts per trillion. Some mm -hmm. states even proposing single digits. And, and again, the reason is because of the concern about these health impacts, you know, that, that we're finding a wide variety of different types of health impacts. And again, it's because this stuff, when it gets in us, it gets in kind of, it sticks to the blood in so yeah, many words. Right. I know I'm oversimplifying, right. but then it's circulating constantly throughout our body. And so it, we have this wide different array of effects within the human body that we're mm -hmm. finding. Uh, and so there's real concern, particularly because the chemicals stay in us and they build up over time, you know, that nobody's really been able to identify a safe level. You know, what's right. the level where there won't be right. any harm as, as opposed to well, where do we feel we can set it? And, you know, what, what numbers are we going to use? Uh, it's, it's a real it's a real, uh, it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult problem for regulators and scientists yeah. right now struggling to find out where should that number be. And what wow. we have seen is a consistent trend to lower and lower and numbers. Lower, lower. Like, yeah. 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 Just, it's just amazing. I mean, I, when I was watching the movie, uh, you know, there was a scene in the movie where DuPont basically drops off all the documents to you. Yeah, you know, for discovery. And, and I mean, it was like a warehouse full. I, I, I was like, oh my gosh, they're trying to bury him. And, <laughs> you know, like here, try to find the needle in the haystack kind of, you know, move here. It seemed like, I mean, of course that's, this is the movie, but you, you can, you can confirm this, but I mean, how long did it take you to go through those documents to really, you know, start putting the pieces together and go and OMG this it's right here. Yeah, well, you know, and unfortunately, the movie was pretty accurate in the way in which the discovery process worked here. I mean, this, keep in mind, this started back in 1998. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is the days before everything was on computer disks and before everything right. was searchable on computers. We still went through good old hard copy paper files. Uh, you either went over and, and reviewed the company's files and went through them yourself, or they sent you big boxes full of paper files. And so that's what happened. I got lots and lots of boxes of paper files and had to sit down and go through them page by page. And, you know, this is one of the things I've pointed out when I've spoken with uh, law students in law schools is, you know, remarkably, um, it's a good thing that it worked that way back then, because I don't know if we would have figured any of this out or discovered the whole PFOA issue if it had started today. Because mm -hmm. nowadays, when you start a case, you have to sit down and you tell the other side what, what search terms they have to use to go through their computer database and find those documents for you. It's not like and good luck. Day. Yeah, good luck getting it all. Okay. Well, we didn't know what we were looking right. for. We didn't know right. that there was a chemical called PFOA, and I didn't know it was called five different names, C8, right. FC143. I would have had no idea what to tell them to go look for. So it was only by sitting down with the actual paper and reading them page by page that we were able to figure this out. And I don't know if we could have done that, if we had to do it under the rules that exist today. Well, was there a moment, you know, when you were going through that process and you, you know, you had like this epiphany and goes, oh goodness. I mean, okay, it's right here. I mean, what was that like? I mean, what happened to you in, in that moment, in a sense? Because I'm sure there, there had to been one or two there that just went, can you believe this? 
Well, you know, I think it was uh, it was gradual. It was a gradual process. And I think, you know, again, folks who've seen the movie or if you had a chance to, to in, in the book exposure, I try to detail a little more of this process. You know, I was I was fairly skeptical of uh, the story I was hearing from Mr. Tennant when he first came in and said, this is there's information being covered up. You know, there's this there's documents that are, we are getting and that it took me a while to actually start to see that what he was saying actually was correct. And, you know, some of this uh, I had to read over and over. I had to sit down with experts. I, we had to retain you know, toxicologists and risk assessors and epidemiologists to, to make sure, am I reading this right? Am yeah, I, do seeing, I understand this right? Right. Because, you know, it's, it's difficult when you, you see something that seems so inconsistent with, right. you know, if, how could this be true? How, if this is the case, you know, how, how could this be in the water? How could, how could this be going on for 10, 20 years and nobody's said anything? I must be missing something. So right. it was a gradual process for me to realize this was as bad as Mr. Tennant thought it was, if, and frankly, was much worse. I mean, okay. Can you describe the moment when you went to his farm and you're sitting in there and he starts, you, you see some of the evidence of the, those cows, you know, dying and he shows you that field. I mean, where he's, I mean, what was that like? I mean, that should have been like the, the, like, okay, I'm taking your case. This is it. I, I, I can't, yeah, I can't stand on the sidelines here. You know, when uh, when we first met with Mr. Tennant and also, you know, with his wife, Sandra, we had a chance to look at his videotapes and the photographs that he had taken. It was pretty powerful. I mean, very mm -hmm. powerful. In fact, you know, again, in the movie and in the documentary, you see some of the actual videotape when they're showing the internal organs. Those are the tapes that Mr. Tennant actually took. Mm -hmm. So seeing that was pretty powerful. But going out to the farm and actually meeting with the family, seeing what real impact this had on them on a daily mm -hmm. basis. I mean, this was not just livestock to them or property damage. I mean, these were like members of their family that were getting sick and they were mm -hmm. watching this day after day going, and going to on? see the real impact this was having on real people. Uh, you know, and they couldn't, you know, we couldn't just sit back and wait six months for a report or wait for the experts at EPA to finish their review. Every day, animals were dying. Every day, Mr. Tennant was feeling sicker or his mm -hmm. kids were getting sick. So uh, it really impressed upon me how much of a real problem this was for real people and that, you know, something needed to be done pretty quickly. Right. I mean, that's uh, that uh, that scene was pretty powerful. And you're right. I, I, I would have acted the same way if I was in your position. Um, you know, the show. And the story about the the residents in Parkersburg, you know, um, they basically became, you know, the largest epidemiology study group ever in, in history that, that we know of today. I mean, what was it like, you know, for, for you to, you know, work with that, 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 the community, uh, to, to convince them to, you know, come on and, and, you know, give your blood and, and let us, you know, be a part of this study. Uh, I just can't imagine, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't an easy process either. Right. Definitely was not easy. And in fact, you know, nobody had really ever done this before. So we had no idea whether the community really would support it and really be behind this whole idea of doing a massive study. Um, but, you know, you had a lot of people in that community uh, that worked for the company or had family members that did. And a lot of people were hoping that, frankly, the studies would prove that there wasn't a problem. That right. there wasn't harm. So you had people participating for different reasons. But one of the things that really helped uh, was we had received about $70 million in cash from DuPont to use for that settlement. And I think, you know, it was assumed by the <laughs> that we would simply cut checks to everybody and walk mm -hmm. away, you know, and hope mm -hmm. the science would, would be the way we would work out however it worked out. Mm -hmm. But we decided to use that money to actually pay people to come in and have their blood drawn and to provide us medical information. And I think that was critical at getting that kind of participation level. 
because if you had each person came in and got say four hundred dollars, if you had a family of five or six coming in, right. you could walk out with a, a significant amount of money. We had a local group called Brookmar, Doctor Brooks, uh, Paul Brooks, uh, and Art Mayer from the local, the two local hospitals set up this process so that people could walk in and walk out uh, with a check. So it would be a seamless process to come in, have your blood drawn, provide the information and walk out that day with a check. And I think once word got out. They're like, I'm signing up for that. Yeah, yeah they're yeah. like, hey, they're putting their money where their mouth is. This is real. This is this is good for me and my family. And uh, regardless of uh, what side of the issue I'm on, I'm going to you know participate and Exactly. We, money, right? we ended up, you know, being really with an overwhelming and an amazing participation. Again, you know, the, the work of the local doctors there, Dr. Brooks, Dr. Mayer and Brookmar, setting up that process, doing it so that people could could come in and do it easily. You know, we ended up with 69,000 people out of a community estimated at 70,000. <laughs> so wow. it was a pretty amazing participation. Rate. Oh, yeah. Well, OK, so let's talk about this. I mean, so you get everyone to come in and give blood and this scientific review board has been put together, you know, by, by DuPont and, and the plaintiffs to, to, I mean, you guys agreed that this is this, this independent review board will be there to do this review. I mean, what was it like for you to finally get this call seven years later? I mean, I've probably been going out of my mind waiting. It was a long process. And again, you know, since nobody had really ever done this before, we didn't know how long it was going to take. We obviously had hoped it would be quicker, you know, and it was difficult. And you see some of this, they captured some of it in the film, you know, where it's, time didn't stand still. Uh, people continued to get sick. People continued to die in that community while we waited for this science. But mm -hmm. we wanted to make sure, you know, the, and the community wanted to make sure that we got the right answers, that the science was done correctly and whatever needed to be done to do it correctly got done. And I think we that was successful. Uh, but it was a long, grueling process, uh, particularly for the people in that community who had to wait and wait for those answers. Um, but, you know, at, at the end of the day, it worked. You know, that process was able to confirm that the chemical was linked with six diseases, including two types of cancer, which allowed those people who already had those diseases to go forward and actually get compensated uh, for right. those diseases. And people who didn't yet have them could get free medical testing and monitoring to make sure they knew if they started to develop them. So uh, it took a long time. But in the end, it, it, it ended up with a tremendous result for the people in the community. Wow. I mean, that's just amazing uh, just to hear that. I mean, that's such a positive outcome in, in the midst of a, you know, a, a tragedy, right? I mean, but at least there's some you know, good that's come out of that for sure. Uh, you know, because really all the money in the world is not going to bring back your loved ones or, or take, you know, give your health back. Right. I mean, it's, that's right. And, that's and unfortunately, you know, as you see in the film, um, uh, you know, DuPont um, fought us and fought, you know, the individuals who had these claims. We had to go to trials and we actually had to take, uh, you know, we went through three trials of people with cancer and got verdicts against DuPont in each one of those. And it wasn't until the middle of the fourth trial, you know, that DuPont finally agreed to settle the claims for those people. But we had about 3,500 at that point. Uh, who had one of these six diseases. And then just recently we settled several dozen more of, of those cases. So um, unfortunately it was a difficult process, but I hope that when people see the film dark waters or they the, the documentary, the devil, we know. Yeah. Or, you got to watch that too. The devil. We That's a, that's a really good accompanying documentary. And I'm hoping they see that in the end, you know, it is worth it for people to stand up and speak at it might take a long time. It might be a long, difficult process, but it can happen. You can actually, you can actually change the laws. You can actually get the science confirmed and you can actually get relief for being harmed from this stuff. And, you know, I think if anything, it, it sends a, a positive uh, message too about our legal system. You know, a lot of countries, you can't do this. You can't right. go into court, but here at least, 
It's long, it's difficult. Nobody should have to go in and do it, but at least we have the ability to do it here and it can work. Yeah. I'm sure there was a bunch of quote unquote seem seem like shenanigans going on back and forth with, you know, <laughs> the law process here, you know, just getting stymied left and right until finally you broke through. I mean, talk about the struggle a bit, if you could, Robert, about, you know, what you endured through this, you know, process, because I don't think people really give you enough credit for fighting the fight. And I want to hear what it was like, if you could. Well, it was a, uh, it was a long process, um, you know, and, and I luckily had the ability to meet and work with amazing clients, you know, people like Wilbur Tennant and his wife and, that, and the entire Tennant family, who I still talk to, you know, or people like Joe Kiger and his wife, you know, people in that community that are, were willing to take this on, you know, and stand up in a community like that, that wasn't necessarily in favor of doing something mm-hmm. like this, you know, when right. it's the biggest employer in town. And, you know, this was this this was uncharted legal territory. You know, at the time we took on this case, particularly for when it, when, we, when we filed the class action on behalf of everyone with the contaminated drinking water, you know, the, we were pursuing a medical monitoring claim. It was a fairly new type of claim at the time uh, and bringing it as a class. I mean, there were a lot of legal hurdles. We ended up having to go to the West Virginia Supreme Court several times back and forth on appeals and challenges. And it was a long struggle. And in the middle of this, you know, when we finally got the settlement and finally set up the science panel, you know, this seven years that we're waiting for these results, you know, what's also happening during that time frame? We had a massive economic meltdown. Uh, you know, yeah. the 2008, 2009, the economy collapsed. So yes, here we are with this case that's costing a lot of money. We we're, we're, have all these experts and we don't know, you know, where it's going. We've got people that are still getting sick and dying while we're waiting for that. And the economy is collapsing around us. So, you know, you see some of some of the uh, the, the, the results of that stress, I should, shall I say, uh, in the film. Uh and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it was stressful for a lot of folks, uh, the people in the community, uh, you know, my partners, our law firm, um, you know, everyone wanting to know and ma- wanting to, to make sure that we got the correct scientific answer here um, and doing it in, in a context where we're sort of, cr- you know, creating it as we go. Um, you know, nobody had really done it. There really wasn't a a blueprint for us to follow. And there wasn't a timeline that anybody knew about. So, um, you know, it's easier when we look back, you know, and with hindsight, uh, but at the time we had no idea where it was going to end up. So it was a stressful process for a lot of folks. I mean, your wife has to be a saint. I mean, (laughs) the way (laughs) that, yes. (laughs) Thank you, Lord, for Mrs. Pilat, she is wonderful. I mean, you guys, uh, I mean, just seeing her in the movie as she was portrayed by Anne Hathaway, you know, I mean, she's stuck by you through thick and thin, uh, wondering if you were crazy or not, you know, doing what you were doing. Um, you know, there definitely seemed to be some sketchy moments there where you thought maybe someone was after you or looking at, you know, because you were taking on the big guys. And, you know, I, I'm sure you had some nervous moments, didn't you? Yeah, you know, it was uh, the scene that you're referring to in the film. Yeah, it was based on, you know, a real event where I had just taken the deposition of the CEO of DuPont in their headquarters in Wilmington and uh, was walking back to the parking garage that day and thinking back to a call I'd had with my parents actually the night before when they were, you know, talking to me the night before I was taking this deposition, asking me, why was I staying in the DuPont Hotel? And who else knew what I was, you know, who else had access to these documents and what would happen if I wasn't there? And we know this all go away. So those were the thoughts that were going through my head as I was walking back to my car in this fairly empty parking garage that day. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think they captured those feelings well (laughs) in the film. But, Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, I think that's why it was incredibly important that we found a way to get this information out uh, and get it to the public, get it in into the public domain so it c- couldn't just be made to go away. You know, if you saw the film, you saw there was a uh, a clip, for example, from a 2020 show on ABC back in 2003. Yeah. You know, think about that. 
That was 2003 when they were talking about Teflon right. and this chemical in the blood. Right. And then everything kind of went away it for went 10 dissipated. years. Right. So, uh, you know, I think we're, we hopefully are at the point where there are people. And again, one of the reasons I, I, I thank you for the opportunity to have this discussion is the ability to keep talking about this. I'm hopeful that with the films, with the book, all of that, it can't go away again. It can't go right. under, under the cup, under the covers and under the carpet. Uh, and the story just disappear that I hope that we've, we've gotten to the point where, uh, you know, there's no way to, to just uh, pretend this never happened again. Absolutely. No, I mean, and that's, that's, you know, one of the reasons we have this platform is to communicate these types of topics to the listeners and to the, to the community, because, you know, there's so many things that are going on, whether it's, you know, this type of an emerging contaminant situation or some other topics that are really, you know, uh, that are important to hit on. And, and this is a great forum for that. And I appreciate you uh, coming on the show. Um, when we looked at, uh, you know, when you looked at this uh, situation, I mean, it took about 18 years or so, didn't it, to finally win a, a verdict against uh, DuPont on this this uh, this case? You know, I think we uh, we took on the case for Mr. Tennant in late 1998. We settled his case in 2001. Then we took on the class action in 2001 settled that the class portion in 2004 uh in those folks you know that once once the links with disease were confirmed those people were finally able to move forward and as i mentioned dupont fought all of those we had to go to right. trial so the first case that actually ended up going to trial uh was in wasn't until late 2015. so you know some 14 years later and then the settlements uh finally occurred in those cases in 2017. Wow. So a long process, long that's, process. That's a long haul. That's just, you know, well, Hey, you know, let's talk about your book exposure. So what can we expect from it compared to say the movie? Because is it, you know, kind of like the accompanying, uh, it is, is the movie really based on the book? Uh, did the book come first? Uh, you know, how did, how did that work? I think they basically both came out around the same time. The, the, the book was released in October and the movie was released in November. Okay. Uh, and the, 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 it, in exposure, what I really try to do is provide a lot more detail about the, the history of what really transpired here, um, what, it, what was going on, uh, not only from uh, the legal side, you know, what was... What, the, the, the games that were being played through the legal process. Um, and, but also what was going on in the scientific world, you know, how, how information was being manipulated in scientific journals and what was going on in the regulatory side as well with not only the federal EPA, but state agencies, particularly the state of West Virginia's EPA. Um, and then the legislative process, sort, sort of seeing all these different areas that were going on at the same time. And, right. you know, it wasn't just a legal case. It wasn't just as a lawyer walking into the courtroom and filing our briefs and handling everything there. I mean, this, to, to, to be able to do what we were able to do and finally get to the result we were able to get to, you know, we had to be also uh, dealing with these uh, regulatory issues, monitoring what was going on on the regulatory side, what was happening on the scientific side, what was going on with the, with the manipulation of the media through PR firms and yeah. things of that nature. So the book really tries to show how all of these different things were going on in the background and gives you a little more detail about uh, some of the, 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 the strategy during the legal case and how, what was happening in the scientific world, just a little more of the, the background of the detail. Well, that's, that's great. And, and I've seen, I've read some of the book, I haven't got all the way through it yet, uh, but I'm going to, because uh, you know, what's interesting about the podcast recently, I've had about, I want to say a good half dozen authors come on the show and I get to spend time reading their books and, and getting to really know the material and, and, uh, and I'm halfway through yours and I still have a little more to go, but uh, I've seen the two movies and, and, oh my gosh, you know, it's just like, uh, has really made me uh, think about how important uh, this topic is in the industry. And, and, you know, one of the challenges I think that we're all facing 
Um, you know, like for instance, you know, as a consultant helping clients try to, you know, figure this stuff out is, you know, it's like, well, how do you sample, uh, and detect at 70 parts per trillion effectively? I mean, you know, one of the big problems that we have is there's really only about two EPA approved methods for analytical testing of, of PFOS, you know, chemicals, which only gets you maybe about. 45 chemicals at the max or thereabouts. I mean, there's, you know, you can't really see all of them yet. Uh, and maybe you can get more with some uh, modified methods that aren't quote unquote EPA approved, but what, what's going to take for, you know, EPA to kind of eventually, you know, put out more approved methods, right? Um, also methods that will address other media, like say soil and, and uh, you know, groundwater or, uh, you know, leachate or some other type of, you know, chem, you know, uh, media that's going to be a problem. Air, the air is another one that's going to be, a, I think, a target, uh, you know, pathway that's going to be a, of concern. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, that's one of the things I kind of had to learn as I was going through this process, not being a, a, uh, a scientist or a chemist or, uh, but working with analytical chemists who were help me, helping me understand the evolution of the analytical methods here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and how we went from certain types of methods from gas chromatograms to liquid, you know, LCMS and all, all of all of this that is sort of uh, mind boggling for those of us who are mere lawyers and not the scientists. <laughs> but uh, there has been a definite evolution here. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is, you know, the companies that were making this stuff um, knew how to sample for it and knew how to find it in water going back decades. Uh, right. you know, I think uh, DuPont's first water method was maybe like around 1981, 1982. Mm -hmm. And some of their first water sampling was in 84. Uh, and, and same thing with blood. I mean, we're talking about blood sampling going back into the 70s. So uh, one of the things, as you said, you know, what we're, what we're learning is there are more and more of these PFAS chemicals and it takes you know, there's a process and it takes time to get these methods approved and published and accepted and going through all that process. And, you know, it's interesting because one of the things, if you look back in the history, one of the things the companies did early on was use what we call a total organic fluorine method, you know, which would pick up anything that has an organic fluorine compound mm -hmm. in it. You know, keep in mind the orga that these organic fluorines are typically all the man-made perfluorochemicals. Right. Uh, so if you look at what was the what the industry was doing, they were sort of looking at this uh, sort of uh, a method that would capture all of the PFAS. And then over time, as the concerns grew about the chemicals, you almost saw this narrowing of the methods to only certain specific ones. And now I think we're going to see something maybe moving back toward a method kind of like total organic flooring, something that can capture all of that. Just because to see if it's present. Right. Particularly when we don't necessarily even know the identity right. of all of these different PFAS chemicals. You need something like that can, that can really kind of globally capture the whole group. That's uh, a good so, point. So it's, it's interesting if you look at it from that historical perspective. We're kind of going back to where the companies were decades ago when they wow, first. Wow, yeah, them. that's a good point. So, well, what do you what? I mean, I've kind of heard some timelines here for for EPA to officially, you know, kind of regulate, put out the you know the regulatory limits that will be approved uh, as law. I mean, we're thinking it's looking like you know 2028, 2027 before you know, it can be promulgated. Is that, is that about right on the timeline? Well, you know, I, I try to be cautiously optimistic here when I talk about EPA yeah. and when they're going to actually act. I mean, keep, I have to, again, I, I look at it from my his, the historical perspective here. I mean, the first letter I sent to US EPA asking for federal drinking water guidelines and standards on these chemicals was March, 2001. All right. So we are now 20 years later and we are still waiting for the EPA. And for years, what we heard was, well, we're still waiting to, to find out, you know, we, we want more data. We want more information, particularly when the science panel formed. Well, mm -hmm. let's wait and see what your science panel says and whether it's actually linked with health effects. 
And so when that data finally was confirmed in 2012, that's when we saw US EPA for the first time go out and put PFOA and PFOS on the list of unregulated contaminants for water supplies to at least start testing for. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that in, in what we were told was that's really one of the first steps toward the federal drinking water standard because U.S. EPA is not going to adopt a federal drinking water standard for a chemical unless they know that it occurs across the United States. So we had to start by looking for it and to find out, right. is it a nationally occurring or is it just a local problem we can leave to the states? So right. that sampling didn't even begin until 2013, 2014. And sure enough, it was found all over. So right. then we saw the first guideline come out in 2016 only after that New York Times Magazine article came out in January, which had said, hey, this stuff's all over the country. So we had that, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the guideline. Then we had a series of announcements over the years, going back over 10 years about mm -hmm. action plans. E EPA mm -hmm. announces a, P P a PFOS action plan. I think the first one I recall was 2009. All right. Mm -hmm. That we are going to set federal standards. We are going to look at whether we designate these as hazardous under CERCLA. That's been going on for over a decade. But we heard that announced again a couple of years ago. Um, and as you indicated, we have finally made it to the next step, which is EPA has formally announced that they will move forward with adopting federal drinking water standards for PFOA and PFOS. But that's, as you pointed out, that is a lengthy process that's going right. to take a, se a number of years. So it is painfully slow, this right. process of setting a federal drinking water standard for any chemical, which is why we haven't seen one in years right. <laughs> from EPA. Right. And right. that's why you have states that are moving forward, trying to, to adopt standards in the meantime, and why we're now getting federal uh, legislators that are proposing legislation to require the EPA to set these standards in a more in a quicker manner. So uh, I think it remains to be seen whether any of that federal legislation passes, but I think what it does do is it certainly highlights and reflects how this has become a major concern among a lot of legislators, a lot of different states, even in the industry. You know, folks are saying we need a federal number. Uh, we need some, some more guidance here from EPA uh, beyond this 70 parts per trillion number, which came out in 2016. And most people are saying that number is- Is it low high. enough? And, oh, you know, too high? It's too high. And that the folks you know that have been coming out since then, we've seen a consistent trend with lower and lower numbers below 70 right. parts per trillion. So right. I mean, I think the states are driving- cost. The states are driving EPA to act quicker, it seems like, it feels like, and, and that's a good thing. But I think it's going to cause a lot of, um, I guess, well, I don't know, disruption, maybe not the right word, but confusion, um, you know, especially amongst, uh, you know, the regulated industry uh, that are needing to, uh, you know, basically start addressing this pathway. I mean, it's like vapor intrusion, right? So vapor intrusion was the big, you know, the new uh, pathway that need to be assessed. Uh, when uh, things became, um, you know, a wreck, uh, recognized environmental condition under, you know, all appropriate inquiry. And and that was part of the process. And, and states went after, you know, even closed sites. Hey, reassess this uh, vapor intrusion pathway. Well, now it's like PFOS is going to be like the new, the new pathway. Like we didn't sample for it. Uh, now you need to, uh, you know, go back and let's test for it. Because if it's there, now you got to do something about it. I mean, that's, I think, going to be a big challenge, don't you think? Uh, absolutely. And in fact, that's uh, sort of the new wave of litigation that I think we're all seeing right now um, that we're involved in as well. We're representing states through attorney mm -hmm. general's offices. We're representing water providers all over the country who are now dealing with the reality that they are being required either under state rules or under by customer demand, you know, that to, to put in very expensive filtration systems, for example you know, to deal with the presence of these chemicals that are, that are being found in the drinking water. 
and having to incur real costs. I mean, millions and millions of dollars to put in filtration and to deal with the monitoring and the sampling. And right now, you know, you've got the folks that made these chemicals, you know, fighting any kind of responsibility for those costs. Even though this stuff, again, these man-made chemicals are essentially fingerprints back. You know, if you find it in the water, you find it in the soil, you can pretty much know where it came from, which companies made these. Uh, yet they're, they're fighting that responsibility, which is forcing this new wave of litigation. Uh, and as you, as you pointed out, you know, uh, I think we're going to see uh, this continue as we start looking at and identifying additional sources of this stuff. Right. You know, additional places where it's been used uh, as as states like, uh, you know, a number of states have started comprehensive statewide sampling programs. Right. You know, no. For example, in Michigan, in New Jersey, you know, where they're going out and sampling. Well, as you find it in the water, then the next step, of course, I think folks are going to start looking to back back upstream. Where did it come from? And right. you're going to see in some states have even started uh, uh, putting PFOA and PFOS as hazardous under their state Superfund laws. Wow. So you can see NPL sites, Superfund sites possibly being reopened. And they have, that's a real concern to people who are, let's say you're a water provider and you're oh, having yeah. to clean this out of the water and that suddenly this material becomes hazardous. Well, then your disposal costs of dealing with oh, the spent carbon. It's, it's a ripple effect, right? Yeah. It's a domino effect. It's going to you know just expand. I mean, I've, I've just uh, we just had a client the other day, and they said, yeah, the um, uh, their uh, PTOW just put on uh, PFOS treatment uh, standards for PFOS. Well, and, and I was like, I, wow. I mean, a local PTOW is doing this, and I think it was in Atlanta area. So it's like it's coming, guys. That's why it's so incredibly important that we deal with who is properly held responsible for these costs. I mean, these are massive costs that are coming and being pushed down now on wastewater plants, public water yes. providers, the states, you know, local communities. And we need to make sure, you know, that the proper people are held responsible for these costs, you know, billions and billions of dollars uh, made in, in profits for many, many decades. And now the stuff's in our water, it's in our soil, it's in us. Yes. And uh, we, you know, we shouldn't have to be fighting this. And so you're yeah. seeing legislation being proposed to try to, to deal with that as well, to make sure that the taxpayers aren't stuck, you know, funding. Pay, the yeah, foot bills. in the bill. Yeah, right. the government shouldn't be footing the bill. I mean, we, we foot the bill enough for other stuff. I mean, let's, we don't need to add PFAS treatment to everything either, right? I mean, come on. Uh, before you know it, you'll have your drinking water bill comes to, you know, your water bill and there's going to be PFAS treatment, you know, surcharge. I guarantee it's going to start coming because how else are they going to pay for this stuff? Well, the company <laughs> that made the stuff should be paying. Well, I, I agree with that. <laughs> I agree with that, Rob. I totally yeah. agree with that. It's yeah. man. But uh, now, okay. So is it becoming more difficult uh, to, you know, rely on say, sampling analysis for, um, you know, from methods that aren't quote unquote EPA approved to, you know, make a claim or, you know, to, I mean, I, I'm just wondering how is this going to affect uh, say the, the courtroom, so to speak, when, you know, we don't have regulations yet. We don't have enough EPA approved methods yet. We, you know, but we're still having claims against these things. I mean, how challenging is this in, in your, in your field right now? You know, I guess I don't think it's as challenging as it was when we started 20 years ago. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, particularly when it, a, a lot of the cases we were dealing with, we, we were using the company's own sampling results. So it's difficult for them to dispute their own sampling results. Right. You know, and now we do have, we do have, uh, you know, approved methods for many of these chemicals. And in fact, most of the litigation you're seeing out there right now um, most of it's centered on PFOA and PFOS. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, we've got validated methods for that. I don't think there's much debate going on right now about whether those are valid or not. You know, I think they're, they're as we expand the group, you know, and if we start looking at more and more PFOS, that may become more of an issue. But I, I haven't really seen that become a problem yet because it seems as if the regulatory standards are, are coming after those methods have already been developed and a lot of them are already out there. 
Oh, that's good. I mean, I, I do a lot of work around, you know, waste management and compliance and RECRA, but I can't imagine if PFOS became a, a, a listed waste or, or, you know, a hazardous characteristic hazardous waste. I mean, I think the industry would go absolutely crazy. Um, well, I think uh, one of the one of the dynamics really that you see out here, and I think uh, one of the reasons why there's such um, debate and discussion going on right now about whether these chemicals, particularly PFOA and PFOS, should be hazardous, is a lot of the places where this stuff's been found in the water have been outside military bases, outside Department of Defense facilities, where particularly firefighting foams were used sure. in the past. And so you have massive contamination um, and the, the Department of Defense or the military sites have been taking the position that we somehow can't go out and clean it up because it is not designated hazardous. You know, and our budgeting Under only surplus. allows us to, to, to use our funds for designated circla hazardous substance cleanup. Sure. So you have this sort of catch-22 going on. Yeah. Um, and in the meantime, the communities and the water districts, you know, are caught in the middle. Um, right. uh, but, you know, the reality is, again, in those situations, those chemicals all came from these same original manufacturing companies. Back to the uh, source, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. And so that's where you're seeing a lot of this litigation right now, particularly a lot of these cases that are involving firefighting foam. You've got thousands of these cases now. They've all been consolidated into one federal court proceeding down in South Carolina where um, you know these issues are playing out right now in the courtrooms. What's your take on PFOS uh, responses, I guess, from a global perspective? I got to imagine you've been contacted quite a bit to address or support you know, cases outside of the U.S. What What's that been looking like? What's your take on, you know, what other countries are doing and how bad is it in other places? Yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, it, the PFAS problem is a global problem. You know, this stuff does not respect national boundaries. It doesn't respect state boundaries. I mean, these chemicals move globally. They not only move through the water, they move through the product stream, they get up into the air. And you know, there's been a lot of studies done showing that the way this stuff moves through atmospheric transport, you know, it falls down in the rain. It's why we're finding this stuff in polar bears and Arctic ice caps. Uh, you know, it's everywhere. And because of that, we're also seeing global awareness now that we need to be dealing with PFAS in a global way, in an international way. You know, you, you regulate it. And that's great that we're phased out PFOA and PFOS, for example, the eight carbon C8s here in the US. Manufacturing is still occurring in other places. So that stuff then moves through the environment uh, if it's still being made somewhere else. So I, I have, have uh, had the opportunity to speak with a bunch of different international organizations with the UN, certain groups within the UN as well. They are focused on PFOS and they are focused on trying to find a way to address it, they're, they're looking a lot more at it as a class of chemicals than we do here in the U.S. You know, in the U.S., particularly at the federal level, we're still very focused on one I'm chemical at a time. Different. You know, in this, this case, has been used sort of as the poster child of how that doesn't really work very well. Look how long it took to get all of the information out that was there for decades about yeah. PFOA. And we still haven't got that regulated at the federal level. You know, if we have to do that for each one of these PFAS, 20, 30 years for each one, and meanwhile, we're all exposed, being used as guinea pigs. So in, you see a movement now to try to address PFAS as a class, kind of like dioxins or PCBs, you know, that we don't address each one individually, but you look at the shared characteristics of the chemical, I mean, of the carbon fluorine bond. Uh, right. You see a lot more of that being discussed overseas, frankly, than we've seen today here in the U.S. But there are definitely efforts to deal with this under international treaties, you know, to have them listed under the POPs Treaty and, and Stockholm Convention. So a lot of effort right now. Um, I, you know, the, there are massive contamination sites, not just in the U.S., but yeah. in Australia, in New Zealand. In right. the Veneto region of Italy, there's a massive contamination site there. Um, in Germany, in Belgium, there's been a lot of news lately about a facility, a 3M facility in Belgium. So 
it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Wow. Wow. Well, I mean, Robert, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I mean, I feel like I want to go longer and get some more details and have a a good conversation. And maybe what we could do, fingers crossed, we bring you back on the show down the road and and maybe do an update on what's going on in the PFOS world. Because it seems like I'd imagine this is probably a full-time job for you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm in my 30th year at the Taft Law Firm and uh, 22 years working on PFOS. And uh, I think we've got a lot of work to continue, but at least I think there's a, a, you know, a good message here with the PFOS story and particularly with PFOA that things can change, you know, and even, even if it seems like insurmountable odds, you know, how do you get something that's completely unregulated like this, that's been out there for decades, you know, it's happening. We're seeing the laws start to change. We're seeing the regulations start to change. We're seeing activity at the national, federal, international level. Uh, and all of that, you know, because, uh, you know, that it's doable. People standing up, speaking out, insisting that we address these problems. It can be done. It's It may take time, but yeah. it can be done. Yeah, no, I agree. Well, you know, again, such an honor to have you on the show today. Thank you for your time. Really so appreciate much. all your hard work on this and, and the outcomes that are happening and just the, the the change in the industry and the minds that are being changed in, as, as it relates to how bad this chemical or these classic chemicals really are. And uh, so much more to come on this topic in the future. But uh, thanks for coming on the show today. And we'll look forward to catching up with you down the road. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure being here.